Hello, this video is part of a series on the new Cajun model and its implementation in Dynair. In this particular video, I will show you how to incorporate the zero lower bound on nominal interest rates in the canonical new Cajun DSG model. We'll discuss why and how this has an adverse effect on welfare and how optimal policy under discretion and commitment looks like. And we'll use Dynair to compare both cases. Now, if you want to study this more theoretically, please refer to Gali's textbook as I'm basically covering chapter five here. Uh, the code I'm using and presenting is based on work by Johannes Pfeiffer. There are timestamps in the description of the video, so feel free to skip ahead. If you find this video useful or if you spot any mistakes, please let me know in the comment section below so I can update the description. And lastly, before we start, check out my blog on more stuff on DSG models and Dynair. All right, let's dive in. Now, in many macroeconomic models, we need to deal with occasionally binding constraints. So, for example, if you want to study a positive constraint on investment, so-called ir irreversible investments, or you have an upper bound on hours worked, or there are some borrowing constraints for households, firms, or banks in models with financial frictions, in all these models, we need to deal with those occasionally binding constraints. And maybe the most prominent one in the last decades has been the zero lower bound on nominal interest rates. And there is a huge literature that tackles this case from many different perspectives, uh, not only theoretically, but also empirically. In this video, I want to focus on the implications of that bound on welfare and on optimal monetary policy. Our laboratory is going to be the baseline log linearized new Keynesian model, where we have shown that an interest rate rule that mimics the natural interest rate and follows the Taylor principle is able to mimic the natural and effective allocation uniquely. Uh, that is, it stabilizes prices and it yields an output gap of zero. So this is what has become known as the divine coincidence. Now what happens if this model is hit by shocks that drives the economy to the zero lower bound? Now let me quickly recap what is the model structure that yields this divine coincidence result. Okay, so we have the new Keynesian Phillips curve and the new Keynesian IS curve in terms of deviation from output from the natural output, that is output under flexible prices. And let's assume also that there is a subsidy that effectively offsets any market power by the monopolistically competitive firms in the intermediate goods sector. So this natural allocation is also the efficient one. That is marginal costs are equal to the marginal product of labor and any markups are offset by this wage subsidy. Now the optimal allocation is defined such that output behaves exactly like the natural or efficient output in this case, so the output gap is always zero. And the central bank stabilizes prices, so the inflation rate pi here is also zero. And the nominal interest rate is equal to the natural interest rate. And if you have a look at the equations, you can actually see that pi equals zero implies that the output gap is zero and this automatically leads, yields the nominal interest rate is also equal to the natural interest rate. So the natural or efficient level of output is a byproduct of price stability. And this is then what we call divine coincidence. And we can get this allocation by implementing an interest rate rule right here that follows the natural interest rate, but there's also a presence of a threat or a strong response more than one for one to an eventual deviation of the inf of inflation from target. And this is sufficient to rule out any indeterminate solution. Okay, that was the idea behind the Taylor principle. This parameter needs to be above one. Now let's incorporate the zero lower bound on nominal interest rates in this model. First, we need to think how do we get there, okay? And here I want to consider adverse demand shocks on the natural interest rate. And note that the natural interest rate can decline either due to a positive productivity shock or a negative demand shock in this model. And let's study this case when this drop is so large that this induces the zero lower bound on interest rates. So up to period zero, the central bank is able to conduct optimal policy that is to achieve price stability and an output gap of zero. Then at period zero, there is a series of shocks or a large shock for several periods that are such that the economy goes to the zero lower bound. And then at some period TZ, 
we leave the zero low bound and the central bank can again follow the, the optimal simple rule. Now, what is the optimal response under discretion or commitment that maximizes welfare in this model? And we have shown that this is equivalent to minimizing the loss functions where we sum two variances, first the variations in inflation deviations plus the variations in the output gap uh, weighted by this parameter var theta. That is actually the ratio of the slope of the new Keynesian Phillips curve divided by the demand elasticity parameter. So, okay, let's first study optimal policy under discretion and then under commitment and then combine these two cases. So under discretion, the central bank decides in each period their action, okay? So, and they want to minimize the contemporaneous loss function subject. So this is the contemporaneous loss function subject to the new Keynesian Phillips curve and subject to the dynamic IS curve. Uh, note that those variables at t plus 1 can actually be taken as given because in t plus 1 the central bank re-optimizes, okay? They are able to re-optimize so they do not really care about the effect on expectations here. Okay, so now let's take the first order conditions with respect to inflation and with respect to the output gap and combine them to get this first order condition right here. Now, taking the derivative also with respect to the instrument, to the interest rate, we get a so-called mixed complementary problem. That is, whenever the interest rate is positive, so the zero lower bound does not bind, this equation needs to hold. And, and in Dynair, we can communicate this via a MCP equation tag. Alternatively, you could also think about setting up a complementary slackness condition, uh, for instance, when you use the max operator, but numerically this gives uh, rise to singular Jacobians, um, so the MCP way is the better one. Now let's have a look how to implement this in Dynair. Okay, let's have a look at this model. Um, in this implementation, I'm expressing all variables and deviations from their steady state, except the interest rates. Okay, so we have inflation, the output gap, the interest rate, we have the, na the analyzed natural interest rate, we have analyzed inflation rate, we have this additional Lagrange multiplier, we have analyzed nominal interest rate, and we have the nominal interest rate that would correspond to this Taylor rule. And I'm declaring the natural interest rate as an exogenous variable because I want to have a shock here. I'm also using a ZLB indicator. This is basically a dummy variable that is used to shut off the Taylor rule during the period when we hit the zero lower bound. And we switch it on again after the zero lower bound uh, because without a Taylor rule, there is a scope for multiple equilibria and having this indicator here ensures that we have a unique and determinate solution. Now the parameters, we set the parameters to this parameterization. Here again, the Interest rate is either, so if the zero lower bound indicator is one, then we are in the zero lower bound, so then this will be equal to the nominal interest rate. Or if we are not in the zero lower bound, then this with the underscore here, this interest rate will be equal to the one that would follow this Taylor rule, okay? So this is the new Keynesian Phillips curve. This is the dynamic IS curve. This is the Taylor rule. This is the combined first order condition um, with respect to pi and x. And here is the mixed complementary problem, okay? So whenever we, we add a MCP tag, so whenever the interest rate is above zero, then this equation needs to hold, okay? So we communicate this to the solver. And then there are some additional um, definitions. So the analyzed natural interest rate is four times the quarterly. The analyzed inflation is four times the quarterly inflation. And the analyzed nominal interest rate is four times the max of either zero or um, this ii underscore variable. So whether or not we are on the zero lower bound or, or not. Now we're doing deterministic simulation, so we need to set the initial and terminal conditions to the steady state. Again, all variables have a steady state of zero except the interest rates. So I'm setting the zero lower bound indicator to zero. Um, the initial condition that we are not in the zero lower bound, but we are in steady state. 
Okay, then I'm computing the steady state and this will then also set the terminal conditions to these values here. The shocks, um, I want to have a shock for say six periods where the natural interest rate drops quarterly by one and the zero lower bound indicator is also set to one that we switch off the Taylor rule but afterwards it is switched back on. Now I'm doing perfect foresight setup. Um, let's simply do 20 periods. And very importantly, we have to communicate to the perfect foresight solver that we have a mixed complementary problem. So we need to set the LMMCP option. And then I'm simply doing some figures here. Okay, let me run this. And we get this picture. So just the presence of the zero lower bound is enough that we cannot achieve divine coincidence. There are obviously welfare losses here. Okay, so the output gap drops quite largely on impact and stays low until we leave the zero lower bound because the shock vanishes. The central bank immediately reacts and we are back to the divine coincidence case. Okay, now what about the case under commitment? So in period zero, the fall in the natural rate has materialized. Okay, now the central bank needs to decide on paths for x1 and pi1, x2 and pi2 and so on to minimize expected losses. Okay, and the first order condition for any period t are those paths given these two equations right here. So this is the first order condition with respect to inflation and with respect to the output gap. And again, whenever the interest rate is positive, we have a third first order condition that must hold. So this is again the mixed complementary problem. And in the near, we include this uh, via this MCP equation tag. Okay, let's see how this works out in Dynair. Now this is the same model with some changes, okay? We don't have the, for instance, the zero lower bound indicator anymore because we don't need it here. We do in need to include the first Lagrange multiplier and here is also the second one, okay? Again, the natural interest rate is declared as exogenous variable because there are shocks on this natural interest rate. Those are the parameters. It's the same calibration. We don't need a parameter for the Taylor rule because we don't have it here in this model anymore. This is the new Keynesian Phillips curve. This is the dynamic IS curve. This is the first order condition with respect to pi. This is the one with respect to x. Okay, so this is where the Lagrange multipliers enter the equation and our mixed complementary problem equation. So whenever the interest rate is above zero, this needs to hold. Okay, and we communicate this with this MCP tag. And then again, some definitions for annualized uh, interest rates, annualized inflation and annualized nominal interest rate. Okay, note we use here the max operator. Now we set again the initial and terminal condition to the steady state of the non-zero lower bound period. Um, this model is written such that all variables have a steady state of zero except the interest rates here. Now, then again for six periods, there, there is a shock on the natural rate of interest, it drops and let's do deterministic simulations. Again, very importantly, we need to pass the LMMCP option to the perfect foresight solver and make again some figures here. And this looks like this. Okay, I, also under commitment, we see that there are welfare losses. Okay, there is no way we can establish the first best situation, but compared to the, the discretion case, this does not have the large drop on impact if we are under commitment. So let's compare both cases. Let's put them into one figure. And for this, I've written a small script that first runs the discretion case, saves the variables, runs the commitment case, saves the variables, and then makes those figures. So here you can see that the presence of the zero lower bound is in this case, the ultimate source of welfare losses. Um, and those losses result from those adverse demand shocks on the natural interest rate. And those losses cannot be fully avoided. Okay, we, not, we cannot get the first best allocation either under discretion or under commitment. We can see that under discretion, 
both the output gap and inflation experience a large decline on impact and they remain below their optimal values until the shock vanishes. Okay, so the shock stays for six periods and once the shock vanishes, then we get back to the optimal allocation. Under commitment, you can see that when the central bank can commit credibly to a future policy plan, those welfare losses are actually much smaller. Okay, so the central bank promises credibly to adopt a looser monetary policy even after the shock is gone. In the case of discretion, so the blue curve here, we tighten monetary policy immediately after the shock is gone. But under commitment, the interest rate stays low for two additional periods and even below the natural interest rate for another period. And the anticipation of such a policy reduces this initial impact. And this leads to much smaller deviations in the output gap and inflation from target. So this case provides more or less the theoretical underpinning of the so-called forward guidance strategy that is adopted, for instance, by the Federal Reserve or the European Central Bank um, after the uh, economic and financial crisis of 2008-2009. Uh, here, the central bank promised to keep policy rates low for a long period beyond the time when inflation and output would start recovering. Okay, now some more remarks on implementing occasionally binding constraints in Dynair. Um, first, you need to decide whether you simulate deterministically or in a stochastic setting. And there are differences. For instance, if you study fiscal policy at a zero lower bound, uh, typically what we find is that in the presence of uncertainty, the government chooses to increase its spending when at a zero lower bound by a substantially larger amount than it would in the deterministic environment. Numerically, the deterministic environment is also much easier to handle because we are able to tackle all those non-linearities in the model quite accurately. Uh, in the stochastic setting, there are many approximations one has to deal with, so this is harder to do. Uh, more generally speaking, there are also some mathematical and numerical difficulties which are discussed in the literature. So first, how can you make sure that, uh, the, that there exists a solution for both regimes in this case, how to find it and whether this is also a unique solution. Um, moreover, we like to have algorithms that are both very accurate but also very fast and there is a trade-off and one needs to find the, the sweet spot. Maybe as a side note, if you want to go ahead and estimate a model, then you need to redefine the methods to compute your likelihood or the, the moments um, within each of the different regimes. And actually, in the literature, there is an awakened interest to refine and tweak those algorithms, both for simulation, but especially for estimation purposes. Now, for deterministic simulations, you can, of course, include those max and min operators, but note that this will typically, or this will give you a singular Jacobian. And this might be okay in many cases, but those numerical issues can actually be better handled by declaring the Le levenberg markant mixed complementary problem, where the slackness condition is uh, switched on by defining the, the scenario with this MCP uh, equation tag. Don't forget that the solver um, needs this LMMCP option. This needs to be passed on uh, to the perfect foresight solver. For stochastic settings, um, there is uh, a toolbox called Ocbin, which works on linearized uh, models. Uh, this can be used also for estimation and it will be available in Dynair 4.7. The codes and the algorithms are already available in the beta or the unstable version of Dynair 4.7. Um, as of production of this video right now, we are in the process on improving the interface to it. And once that has been decided and implemented, I will release Dynair 4.7. So keep checking out our web website or subscribe to the newsletter or to this channel where I will also make a video on this. Let me summarize. The zero lower bound constrains monetary policy. Okay, we cannot reach the first best efficient and natural allocation anymore. 
being at the zero lower bound is the sole reason why there are welfare losses. Okay, even in a model where in normal times we can achieve the first best divine coincidence uh, allocation. And this carries naturally over to more complicated models with more inefficiencies. Okay, the zero lower bound is another source of inefficiency, which needs special treatment as monetary policy is quite restricted in this case. And there are several interesting issues that uh, we, can, we can tackle here. Think about unconventional monetary policy or introducing fiscal policy in the model. And this can be quite successful when you are at the zero lower bound. In this talk, uh, we've uh, hit the economy by negative demand shocks on the natural interest rate. And actually, the natural interest rate has been quite low for a very long time. And this raises all sorts of other difficulties, not only for modeling, but also in practice on how to conduct monetary policy and how effective it actually is. But I hope uh, in this video, you got some intuition why the zero lower bound needs special treatment. Okay, that's it. Please leave your comments below. I will update the description of the video to correct any mistakes I made. Have a good day.